This is now focusing more on the institute side. So Clarice talk was uh, a lot on the infrastructure, but actually they included a lot of stuff that that we also were thinking about. So about the computing and the and the people, um, yeah, the traveling. So. Um, but it's interesting how much impact the steel or the actual infrastructure has. So what I will be presenting here is kind of a roundup of what the astronomy community is, is using for their science. And it's, um, it's based on the climate issue or two papers that were published in the climate issue by Knut, who's also here, Knut Janke, and by Adam Stevens um, for the Australian community. And I hope to also show a little bit on the on the on in another flying um, analysis that we we have done in the at MPIA in the meantime. So I just wanted to add to the observatories because this is part of the Australian study that they put a lower limit of four tons of CO2 equivalent per year per full-time equivalent, so per astronomer more or less. And that did not include the construction of those sites. So it's yeah, it's it's quite a lot. Um, in our study from MPIA, we did not take into account the observatories. And so if, if we exclude emissions from observatories, then 80%, approximately 80% of the CO2 emission, equivalent emissions is coming from supercomputing and from business trips. And this is why I will focus on those two. And that's ex exactly what uh, Clarice was, was also focusing on. So let's start with supercomputing. Per astronomer, we use around 20 to 30 megawatt hours per year. So 20 was for MPIA and 30 for the Australian community. And that's quite a lot. That's about 10 to 20 times more than in Germany an adult uses uh, privately. So it's if, if you put it down into core hours, it's about half a million core hours, which means that 60 cores are operating nonstop for each astronomer. And this is an average, of course. So most will be below that value, and a few will be above. And until recently, I thought I was one of the who uh, one of the people who were below that. But I now started to ask my collaborators to add into the acknowledgments how much simulations they used. And my the, the lead author told me that uh, he was using 2.5 million core hours for our project. So this amounted to quite a lot of CO2 emissions, especially since the servers were running in Abu Dhabi. So that was not very fortunate, but yeah, it's good to check. So now I'm, I'm, I'm always telling people, please, please look at how many cores you are running. So if we assume the German energy mix, um, which is given here, so about half a ton of CO2 equivalent per megawatt hour, that amounts to 11 tons of CO2 equivalent. This is enough to fly four times from Frankfurt to New York. And to me, it seems that really supercomputing is the biggest issue or the biggest driver of CO2 emissions. For the Australian community, this CO2 factor, which you see here, is twice as high. So they emit double what the German energy mix uh, produces. And uh, actually Heidelberg and the data centers or computing centers that we were using were using electricity that was half as CO2 intense. So we only emitted about five tons of CO2. But and, and this shows that the energy mix is the biggest leverage that we have. And um, yeah, in France, it's much, much better the situation. So if, if you add a life cycle assessment, which was not done here, um, then I uh, rough numbers for data centers is that this adds 20 to 30 percent of CO2 emission. And also the office equipment adds also a little bit if, if you are fully equipped, so uh, about 5 percent. So those emissions uh, are actually even higher, depending on how much yeah, life cycle emissions you yeah, how much you include. Um, and of course, operating your computing systems longer before putting new hardware that, that helps to reduce this. So then we made an analysis of the business trips of MPIA. I hope you can see this little animation here where the business trips from 2018, the destination of our business trips uh, from 2018 until 2020 are. And you see that with the pandemic, uh, we stopped flying around so much. 
so that was good for our emissions um, from getting back to the studies so the Australian study uh, had six tons of CO2 equivalent per year and uh, full-time equivalent in our study we were coming to eight tons of CO2 equivalent per year per astronomer using atmosphere and actually those those are quite different those estimates because um, Qantas uses a multiplication factor of only one so this is how much the uh, radiative forcing is for flights in very high at very high altitudes and atmosphere is using a quite high multiplication factor of three um, we now used a python script to analyze our data which uses a, um, yeah, a multiplication factor of about two and what we do is we, we, we have the destination, we assume a direct flight from Heidelberg there. It's, it's, it's a return flight and we add 20%. So that we, yeah, be, because we will not always take the shortest route. And we also assume that below 500 kilometers, everybody is driving the train and above 2000 kilometers, everybody is flying. And here is the distribution of those flights. This is also based on Didier Barré's um, a tool and he provided uh, kindly provided a table for us so that we could interpolate but we are actually compared to uh, Clarice um, um, assessment we are on the higher so we are at the higher level we we have a multiplication factor of about two so about 100 or 200 grams of co2 per traveled kilometer for long distance flights um, and if you apply the script and correct the numbers then actually the australians are a factor of two higher and we are a factor of two lower because atmosphere also takes into account how good or efficiently the air airlines are operating so we are getting a different view and this is this makes more a little bit more sense because of course australians have to fly the ocean probably more often than than astronomers that do their work within within europe and this is also again only an average so most people will be below but a few can be above so this is from the australian study phd students use uh, about three tons of co2 and senior scientists use 28 tons of co2 equivalent per year and even for these groups there are big differences so so the median is at eight, uh, 16 tons of co2 and there are two senior scientists in the australian community who uh, yeah, used 160 tons of CO2 equivalent. So they were frequent travelers. Um, now coming back to the analysis from the data of MPIA from 2018 to, two, to, to 2020, we had overall 175, uh, 170, uh, 1,700 trips. And uh, most mostly were local, so within Germany and 30% in Europe and only 15% were overseas. But, but if we now reweight this by the CO2 emissions, then you see that 80% of our emissions, 82% actually, are coming from the overseas flights. So that means we really need to reduce overseas flights. And this is just to show how much on average we spent for flying to a different con continent. So four tons, North America, five tons, South America, Australia, seven tons, and so on. And within Europe, it's, 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 it's also a little bit, but it's not so much. So we also had a look at the different reasons for our trips. Off. And here we are only looking at the overseas uh, trips. So the duration is shown on the x-axis, the duration of the trip, and on the x-axis, the number of the trips. And conference trips, we had 100 trips overseas, and they peak at one, one week duration so most conferences take one week and then people fly back for collaborations we had 80 trips that were collaborations and those uh, were also peaking at, at about one um, week but going up to 120 days and then commissioning so in instrument to, to put instrument in instruments into telescopes that those were 45 trips and there the peak is around two weeks because people usually stay longer to to implement the the hardware and we also had observational trips, but only 30, and those were also a little bit longer. So, and this, so the, over, the overseas flights in total uh, sum up to about 1,000 tons of CO2. And per year in researcher, we have about 0.75 overseas flights 
outside of the pandemic. And the Australian community has about three times. And this is why we have the difference in the, in the emissions from the flight. And this is, of course, outside of the pandemic. So before the pandemic hit us, uh, our yearly uh, CO2 emission per researcher was about four tons. But then March 2020 hit, hit us in Germany. And afterwards, um, we only had 100 kilograms per, per, per year per researcher in emission. And here, we are, so every person should aim for a CO2 footprint of two, two tons within the next 20 years. So the after pandemic is, 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 a, good, is a good value to work with. Um, so it, it has shown us that we can fly, fly, fly much, much less and still work. So what can we do? Of course, we need to fly less and replace everything by virtual as much as possible. Then I wanted to highlight that with this Python script, we, we could monitor 50% of MP Max Planck Institute's travel emission on a yearly basis. So that's quite good because we can extract the data directly from the SAP system. Um, and But I think because we can get get along without so much flying. So we really need to focus on computing and the IT infrastructure. And people always use as much as they can. So we, we need to not put more, add more IT infrastructure. And the, the biggest leverage is to use more renewable electricity. So we need to put um, solar panels on every roof and everywhere that, that is free. Um, and the problem in the coming years is that our heating systems and our mobility are being electrified. So there will be more competition for electricity. And that again means we need more renewable en electricity. And with that, I thank you for your attention and we'll stop share. Here.